two, one. Good. It's all done. Welcome, everyone. Week eight. We have a code of conduct that applies to this call. If you have anything that you would like to report, you can write to team at openlifeside.org. If you would like to reach one of us, uh, please use the individual emails that we have added in the notes. Uh, today is a second module of open science where we discuss knowledge dissemination, uh, which means how we would like to share our project more openly. There are three topics that we will feature today, which are preprints, uh, pre-registration and open review. Uh, which will be uh, given by Irache. Irache is one of the mentors in the program um, and will also be speaking today. We would have another talk by uh, Lenny from Open Protocol. And finally, we will have citizen science talk by a team of members who are together building a citizen science platform. I'm very excited about this. So I'll actually hand over to, let me find the correct name. You. Amazing. Uh, so we're starting today with a really quick reflection. Um, so this is just an exercise because um, today, since the cohort call is all about dissemination, it's really important to think about where and when we're disseminating things and whether we should be disseminating them. Uh, because in the name, we have open life science, um, but we aren't radical open uh, proponents. That is to say, we want to make sure that when you share stuff, that it's something that you have consent to share uh, and that is appropriate to share and that isn't putting anyone at risk, for example. So um, I'm actually just going to put myself on mute for a minute or two and just ask over at the very first uh, section, we have the quiet reflection exercise. Um, just add your name and talk about the things that you think can be shared and why. Or if you wish, you can actually reflect on the opposite as well. Maybe is there something that you shouldn't be sharing uh, that in terms of science output or work? And if so, why? Um, and just grab a bullet point and I'm going to stick on mute for a moment.
So um, if you've already finished typing your ideas, uh, maybe run through, have a look at what other people have typed um, and you can add a plus one if you agree, or maybe you could add a comment and say, I'm not sure about this or why do you think that way? Um, so treat it as a discussion where you can add some sub bullet points if you wish. I'll give it a moment or two more and then we'll see if we can run through some of the points. Okay, I'm going to start reading through some of these points. If you would like to, uh, sorry, Otis, um, I'm just realizing I didn't uh, speak very clearly there. I do apologize. I was just saying that we can use the document as a discussion. Uh, so for example, if you want to create a new sub bullet point uh, to continue this or to ask a question about one of the points that we've written, uh, then please do. Um, or you know, to support a point that you really like. Uh, but I'm just gonna read out some of the points that we have um, and also mention that if you would like to comment on something while I'm reading it out, please do unmute and speak up uh, or post in the chat and we'll try and pay attention to what's going on in the chat as well and read those out, either is fine. Uh, so I'm gonna look at some of the big plus one ones that we have. So Emily mentions some of the perhaps easier ones to think about like sharing your data and your code and your manuscripts. But then we look into some more interesting things like sharing grant proposals is something I think that not everyone might do. Um, teaching modules, negative results. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of interesting little things that we might not think to share when we're looking at these. And we have a plus 1K, is that 1000 likes on um, wishing it was easier to share things in um, it, that, that aren't polished the way manuscripts are. It's sort of, I think when I, um, when you watch like an archaeology program right when everyone's digging stuff out and they take out and there's this beautiful clean shiny fine and it's like that is not what you just dug out you've taken that you've cleaned it you've made it beautiful and then you put it on tv um so yeah i agree see, see, seeing some of the di the dirty results <laughs> the interim stuff and the things that didn't go well would be amazing um Georgia mentions work by researchers that's necessary for reproducibility and peer scrutiny, but not sensitive information or sharing stuff to which we don't have consent to share. And I think that's a really important thing. So even if it's something that seems quite trivial, like a survey, you need to double check, have you actually had the consent to share that with other people before you do share it? Um, and we have from Iracha, we have data, tools, questionnaires, um, but not sharing information that puts people at risk, including the members of public and the environment. So I love that, thinking about the world as well, not just actually um, people, which is really beautiful. Um, Emmy, sharing ideas. It's like, yeah, how, how often do we have these ideas that just disappear? And it's like, if we shared it, maybe someone else could have picked it up and made it something awesome. We should absolutely share ideas. Um, can I just jump in there and say that sometimes your idea, you might not have the skill set for it, but if you don't share it, the people who do have the skill set for it, they're able to translate it or able to do so. So you have to share it, even if it seems slightly silly at the time. I, yes, a hundred times yes. I can't plus 1000 this because there's no text. So I guess I'm verbally plus 1000ing it. I'm just lost. I'm confused about what medium I'm communicating in now. Um, okay, we have Anshika talks about sharing blogs. Yeah, share the information you have in a well presented way that's not as formal as papers, for example, that's great. Um, Teresa talks about it, that it depends on the competitiveness of a research topic. So I think that's something that'll be really great to dig into because obviously you don't want to put yourself at risk um, career wise if you feel like you're sharing stuff um, and balancing that can be a really interesting act. Um, I'm losing track of where I am. Uh, Right, Antonio talks about workflows, training tutorials, publications, and issues and requests. Um, Irene talks about <clears throat> code and data. I am beginning to lose my voice. Can someone do the last two bullet points? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can quickly do that. My apologies. I 
I might have recovered actually okay I, I, I know where I was at so you, you don't have to go Thank and hide you. I thankfully I had a drink here so I'm no longer choking um so we have uh successful project proposals once the project has been awarded. Thank you, Carla. And from Lenny, we have sharing of negative results and approaches attempted. Yes, I love that. It's so underreported and so, so gorgeous. Um, if you haven't added to this, but you would still like to folks, please do. Um, there's plenty more room here to continue the discussions and continue the amazing ideas. Um, and I think we're going to move on. Actually, quickly, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask or comment on amongst these uh, before we move on to the talks? Sounds like we're good. I see there's some great comments also in the chat from Renato about ideas I'll never do. <laughs> Just celebrating sharing your ideas. Uh, so next up, we have a talk about disseminating your results when you work on them, disseminating them in early ways. Um, well, I'm, I've just managed to zoom completely out of my document and I cannot read this. However, I do believe that uh, Iracha is, and, and I know I'm still being very nervous about mispronouncing your name and I hope that wasn't too bad, but are you good? You're doing very well. You're doing very well, you. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me just put up my slides in a presentable uh, mode hopefully it's coming up and you can see that okay so thank you so much joe and um, all the organizers of the open life sciences uh, program which is a fantastic initiative for inviting me to be here today to talk preprints um a bit about me uh, i am iracha puebla associate director for uh, asap bio which is a, a non-for-profit organization with a mission to drive innovation and transparency uh, to life sciences communication we have a great uh, interest in supporting um, adoption and awareness around preprints in terms of how life sciences is communicated so i was going to mention a little bit uh, for context uh, the activities that we run around preprints um, we regularly run projects and get the stakeholders together to discuss the different elements of the preprint ecosystem, which are, which are the perhaps upcoming challenges or subjects that may require developing some principles or structures, etc. Uh, we also uh, develop resources all related to preprints, mostly focus on providing information for researchers so that they can make informed choices when they, they choose to preprint, but they're also available to obviously any stakeholder in life, in life sciences communication. And we also run the ASAP Bio community, which is an online global uh, community of mostly researchers, but also some other stakeholders who also have an interest in supporting, uh, again, awareness and, and adoption of preprints. Um, so we're here to talk preprints. What's a preprint? Um, one of the perennial comments and questions. There is no common uh, definition or unique definition. So I'm going to give you one that covers quite a few of the elements. Um, essentially, and many of you may already be familiar anyway with what a preprint encompasses. But um, a preprint is generally considered a scholarly manuscript that is posted by the authors to a repository, repository or platform to facilitate the open and, uh, and broad sharing of their early work without limitations on access. Um, and a definition or description that I quite like and I tend to reuse is one that um, was mentioned by John Inglis, which, uh, who is the co-founder of the preprint servers BioArchive and MedArchive, who has referred to preprints as, as the director's cut of a manuscript, essentially a version that the authors are happy to uh, share with their community and their peers knowing that perhaps it may undergo changes, they may update it um, once they get uh, feedback or it undergoes peer review. So there are a number of uh, uh, elements in that definition and in how we work with preprints that may uh, sound very familiar to how we publish articles and journals. So I thought I would go very briefly over some of the similarities, but also how preprints are different from, from journal articles. The similarities is, as we said, well, both articles and preprints report the scholarly work. Um, and generally, again, some preprint servers cover different outputs, but generally a preprint is the, the full paper with all the information about the study that allows others to replicate it, to appraise it, to provide comments, et cetera. 
Um, preprints are generally assigned a DOI. There are some exceptions to this, like Archive, who use they use their own persistent identifier system. But again, the majority in the majority of cases they receive a DOI so that they can be traced and and, and found. Um, and obviously they can be cited if you have used that in your work. You can add a, a reference and again ref, uh, find that through the DOI. However, there are also differences uh, between preprints and uh, publications and journals. The most important is that the preprint servers will take, will take the version of the paper that you submit. Generally, they do some basic screening just to check that essentially it's a research paper and there is nothing hugely problematic. And they will post the paper without peer review. Um, a few other differences that I thought it was worth mentioning is that preprints uh, allow versioning uh, again, the authors, this means that the authors can post a new version, again, make updates and new work to their paper and post a new version on the server. And linked to this, it means that correcting the paper, if you need to correct it, tends to be much easier and faster than when you publish a, a paper at a journal where it needs to go through the editorial process again so that they decide how do they post a, a correction, what goes into it, etc. So from that perspective, there, are, there is an element of ease and fluidity to, to using preprints. So why are researchers using, uh, choosing to, to use preprints? Um, the first uh, uh, important benefit of preprints is the fact that they, it's the speed of the dissemination. Uh, they allow you to make the work av available almost immediately. If you are familiar with the journal publication process, you'll know that it can take weeks or months, and sometimes if it goes wrong, even years to, to essentially go through the editorial process until the journal will publish the, the work, make it publicly available. And obviously, sometimes you may get rejected and you have to submit to another journal and restart the clock, etc. By comparison, if you post your uh, uh, paper to a preprint server, it will be available in a matter of days, generally. Uh, again, depending on the screening process, which means that you have a record that you can share with your community and request comments. And all of that can happen very quickly. And you can do it either before or in parallel to also submit into a journal. Another important benefit of preprints is, is that they are free to both post and free to access. There is no publication fee, as you may perhaps <coughs> encounter in open access journals. <coughs> Um, there is no element of issues with access. They provide free access. There are no subscriptions or paywalls, um, which means that you can actually reach quite a wide audience. Um, a number of indexing services such as uh, Google Scholar and UPMC uh, actually include certain preprints. So that also provides visibility. And PadMed also now is running a pilot related to COVID-19 preprints. Um, so you can reach a wide audience, which is which can also be useful in terms of your work uh, and uh, garnering attention for your study and uh, potentially attract more citations. There's been a number of studies that have looked at the relationship between the presence of, presence of a preprint and the citations on the eventual journal publication for the same work, and they consistently show um, that when there is a prior associated preprint for, the, for that work, the actual journal publication attracts more citations. So since you've given a head start to other researchers to build on your work. And another element that I wanted to mention that we are very passionate about in terms of preprints is this element of allowing uh, sharing and community feedback. You can get the link of your preprint it with other, uh, others in your community, request comments that you can use to, again, perhaps uh, build on your work revise your paper, improve it. Um, it can also be uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, open in collaborations with others because there may be other groups who are working in a similar line of research as you, and you can get it, you know, they may contact you after seeing your, your preprint. And as something that has happened um, uh, recently is that journals have also taken an interest in this, uh, and some of them have appointed editors who check what's the latest uh, papers uh, posted on preprint servers and may even invite a uh, submission to their journal. So it can actually increase the publication chances for your eventual uh, journal paper. Um, so I wanted to just spend a few minutes uh, giving a few tips in terms of making the preprint and experience as positive as possible. So just a few pointers if you've decided to preprint something, a few of the things that I, I would recommend thinking about. Uh, the first one, is to have a little bit of a think as to which preprint server you would like to uh, post your paper to. 
Um, the preprint server ecosystem is different from journal. Essentially, there are not thousands and uh, thousands of, pay, uh, of servers necessarily, but there's been quite a few uh, new platforms that have launched over the last few years. So now, specifically for the life sciences, which is again where we work, there are around 50 servers available. So a suggestion that I have is uh, that you check the ASAP Bio preprint server directory. We have a list of the different platforms with characteristics that you can check and compare to, to, to fit your needs. Um, there are a few uh, general purpose repositories that also take, apart from the fact that they were set up to, to take for mostly data sets and other outputs, they will also take pay, full paper. So for example, Synod on Fixer, and they will assign the OIs as I, as I explained earlier. One thing to consider as you are thinking where to post, obviously this is your, your choice, but a few things that can be useful is to, to try to think about what elements are important for you and what you want to get out of, of, of again, sharing your work as a preprint. One, Possible consideration is visibility. The, the, the different servers have different communities um, uh, associated with them. Um, so some pay more attention to certain servers, et cetera. So you may want to think which is the best server to, to, for your audience, for your paper. There are also some, uh, uh, for example, funders and again, indexing services that have certain criteria recommendations for the servers that they recommend. So you may want to take that into account if that's something that is relevant for your work in terms of submitting to a server that fits the requirements uh, from your funder. Um, as you are, uh, again, preparing to submit, you should also think if you are eventually thinking of uh, also submitting to a journal, check the journal policy on preprints. Um, the majority of the journals in the life sciences accept work that has been posted as preprints, but they may have different policies in terms of the type of preprint servers that they accept or when they are happy to see the paper posted as a preprint compared to the journal submission. So that's something useful uh, to check. Um, and an important consideration is also to think about the license that you would like to apply to your preprint. Uh, there are a number of licenses available. I, I list the resource that we have on ASA Bio related to the Creative Commons licenses. Um, one thing to remember is that certain preprint servers allow a variety of licenses that you can choose from, while some others actually um, restrict the, the licenses and actually some all, will only post under CC BY. So <coughs> something that you should check prior to posting. Right, so once you have made your choice in terms of the servers, you obviously should prepare your manuscript. Uh, be as careful as you would be when submitting to a journal, perhaps even more. Um, but one important element is, of course, that it, and this is the same as when you submit to a journal, that you, you should have all of the authors on board with preprinting. So make sure that you have that conversation with your co authors. We, again, we have a number of resources on the ASAP Bio website that can help uh, with some of those conversations or some questions that uh, people may have about uh, preprinting. Um, and then obviously we, we very much support open science. So we recommend that you take steps to also share the data, reagents so other tools that we've been just discussing in the earlier exercise. You can add links to that, to your preprint so that the, the preprint can again be a vehicle for, for uh, anyone interested in your paper and your work to also find um, the associated outputs. Right, so once you have done all of that, um, obviously go ahead and post. Uh, the preprint should be available again either immediately if there is no uh, a pr a screening prior to posting or yes in a matter of days and then we very much say yes to researchers that they take the opportunity to encourage feedback and, and share their work with others on social media or email again try to kind of create a buzz about the, the preprint and a conversation going about your work. And with that. I wanted to stop there. You have my contact details there and on the on the agenda document. Oh, and I also included here the list, the link to for the ASA Bio community. Should you be interested in joining us, uh, which are resources and obviously exchange ideas about preprints there. So you're very welcome to join us. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I love listening to these because I always seem to learn so much from the, from all of the talks, even though this is the third time we've run this cohort. Um, so we have quite a few questions in the document. I'm actually just going to pick one for now and ask maybe if you just go and answer the others in the Google Doc if you have a minute. Um, but Irene asks, could you recommend options to post preprints in Spanish or uh, languages other than English? Oh, that's a great... Uh... A great item. I 
great supporter of different languages, not being a native English speaker. Uh, one option uh, that I know about that for sure they take uh, papers in Spanish is Cielo preprints. Um, so it's associated with the Cielo platform in South America. Uh, and I know that they take submissions, uh, not only in English and Spanish, but also Portuguese. Um, so th I, that would be one option. I would need to check which are the other servers that specifically take Spanish, but certainly Cielo preference does. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Shamsuddin, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the good presentation. Um, I have a question. Um, we recently submitted um, a paper for collaboration, and I just saw some other people uh, send it an email asking, what is the password for claiming authorship? So I don't know um, uh, what is the meaning of password to claim, an, claim authorship when you publish a paper. Um, I don't know what is that, so maybe if you can answer that. Uh, because we submit the paper to archive, uh, preprint, and um, I saw people saying, what is the password? And they sent a password, and the password will be used to claim authorship. So I, I don't know if um, you had an idea about something like that. Uh, that's interesting because I had not heard about that before, and I'm not familiar with any either journals or servers that operate in that way, because obviously for, for preprints, in the context of authorship, the same framework as for journal article supplies, where essentially you should have contributed to the work and everyone who contributed should be listed. Um, so I had not heard about that. I'd be interested in, in, in hearing more because it, it's something new to me. So if you're happy to, to contact me and share more on that, I'd be happy to take a look. Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, Raina, um, I think this will be the last question, but would you like to ask your question? Hi, Rachel. Thanks for the for the presentation. I was uh, I, I wanted to ask you something. Um, wh what is your take on peer reviewing of the of the preprints, and and how this will affect also the early career scientists? And and, and asking you because um, I'm I'm working in particle physics and we have been doing archive for a long time. Um, even I I grew up like my academic career has been with that mentality but we do have a peer review system in each one of the collaborations. So before putting everything outside uh, to the archive, we actually have a very long three, four months peer review within the collaborations. When I was a PhD student, when I was an early postdoc, I didn't dare to comment or to do peer review. I was super scared, um, really, uh, like really. It was not until I was like a senior postdoc that I, that I actually felt confident to post a comment on these kind of things. So yeah, I wanted to hear your opinion about that and how it's deal with in, in other fields, basically. Oh, well, thank you for asking. I'm very passionate about preprint review, but for further context, I used to be an editor before, so I'm essentially breathing peer review. Um, I'm a great supporter of preprint uh, pre review in the sense that I think it democratizes the system. Everyone can, can participate. And I think it will bring more diversity to the evaluation and also innovation in how pre, pre, sorry, pre review is done because essentially the, the, the format as a journal is very structured, you know, with certain steps and certain format. And I think that frankly, in the day of the internet, probably we can do new things where you can comment on sections of the paper or not the full uh, paper, etc. The element of, it's all very nice and good to say everyone can participate, but actually, you know, it's a bit daunting to do this in public. I totally understand. Uh, and, and this is why um, I'm personally, for example, very, very supportive. Of, I, f I find it's a very interesting model. The fact that there are journal clubs that are incorporating preprints and actually do the review collaboratively and then post it together because there is, there is this element of you get a certain protection for saying, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this on my own and it's my point of view and people may disagree. That there is this collaborative element of we are, we are sharing this evaluation that we did as a group. Um, so I think this, this would be something interesting if, if it scales further. And something else that we've been discussing recently uh, within ASA Bio, because we, we are doing some thinking about preprint reviews, that it, I think it would be quite interesting if in the future, 
at the time of posting preprints, the authors would actually signal actively, I've done this recently on a, pre on a preprint, to say, we want feedback, please comment. Essentially, you're not going to get into any trouble by telling me that you, you think I missed this or that I got this wrong because that's what I want to hear. So trying to kind of reduce that element of perhaps this, the, the situation being a bit daunting for someone new or who is junior um, in the scientific career to say, actually, please, we want you to participate. But I mean, there is quite a few things that I think could develop in the future around this area. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Can we have a huge round of applause for um, amazing speaker and also some really good questions as well. Thank okay, you. thanks so much, everyone. Um, Malvika, I think you're leading the next section. So I'm leading the breakout room because it's time for you to talk. Uh, motivated by all the discussions we're having, having uh, since the beginning of this call, we want you to think about that science sharing is not straightforward. As we say that everything should be open, there's a lot more thought that goes into when we try to make things open. There needs to be a lot more intentionality. So we have allocated two questions for each room, but you are allowed to choose, well, you should choose one, you're allowed to answer any. Uh, for your discussion. When you are in a spoken room, uh, mutually decide which one you're gonna choose and discuss for the, the next 15 minutes. Or if you are in the written room, you can choose any of those and start writing. We will give you a prompt in the middle of the breakout room to discuss other comments as well. Any question around that? I'm going Before to just but, button really quickly and ask if you haven't added an S or a W to your name, uh, please do just to indicate S for spoken um, in your Zoom name or a W for a written room, just so that we know which rooms to assign you to. Yeah, so speakers, if you don't want to go to the breakout room, you're allowed to stay in the main room, but you're very welcome to interact with other folks. All right. Um, with that, if you want to invite us into one of the breakout rooms, you can ask for help. Uh, there would be a button at the end. Um, and you can also leave any time your room if you need to come back to the main room. But we will send you notification. Are we ready to send? Much. Just opening them now. I hope you had as insightful conversation and discussion as we did. Uh, people are hopefully arriving back. So we will take a couple of minutes to uh, go through one or two rooms um, and see what good insights would, you would like to share with the whole team. So would someone from, would someone like to just nominate themselves? I wouldn't go through the whole seven rooms. Anyone who, who found something very exciting, surprising, disappointing from their conversation, that's also very welcome. Uh, I found it really interesting discussing sort of, we, we were looking at the question of whether budget should be set aside for making research open and thinking about, well, maybe there's another route to kind of getting funding for it and promoting it and saying, this is worth doing and here's why. Um, and I, it was really interesting putting it in a more kind of systemic context of where are the incentives and how do we encourage those incentives and practices to grow, not just like putting aside budget, but facilitating it broadly. So right. yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've, I've also, uh, I've been reading some of the questions around that I have invested a lot of time in my research so why I should share it openly. I, I should give anybody any credit. Does anyone have like good point to debunk that? So to be very clear in open source, a lot of work it happens for free because a lot of volunteers are working on it. And therefore there's the sense that 
all of these work that are going in, will, will it ever be acknowledged fairly, right? There are a lot of practices that might exist. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just probably call a, a couple of names that I see. Uh, Antonio, would you like to share what you've just shared on the document? Yes. Um, so I think uh, open having a project open uh, with your code and and um, or analysis, it, it can you can be benefit from the, from this because other people can just read it, find errors, uh, can contribute to, and so you can improve the overall analysis uh, and your project. Um, so I think um, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what we want to think about, that, that our work shouldn't be the end of the work, our sh work should be the beginning of someone else's work, um, and they also help in the process. So there was one team uh, where Jennifer was. Jennifer, would you like to share some insights from your group? Um, so... I actually wound up um, getting disconnected in the middle of my team's discussion. So I think I should probably defer to another team member to summarize that. I was just gonna jump in there because I was in Jennifer's group, but I was also with Georgia. So Georgia already gave a bit of a recap um, on what we discussed, um, but we were talking about the budget spend, um, so should should researchers set aside a budget to make their work open? So just seconding what Georgia said is it's quite difficult to convince researchers of the benefits or the incentives of why they should actually set aside a budget to make researchers, to make their research open. Um, so it's about sort of signposting resources on how they can do it, maybe cheaply or easily and get the right expertise and help on where they can publish results. Um, so yeah, we were just we were just brainstorming really how easy it is to, to publish and the benefits. I think Georgia covered it pretty well, to be honest. Thanks so much. I'm just gonna highlight a couple more from the notes that people are in agreement that there needs to be collaborative pathways. There needs to be highlight of collaborations and acknowledgement of contributors and acknowledging that equitable labor uh, is visible uh, for everybody who contributes. So there's a lot of collaboration happening there. I think it's a good time for us to move on to our next speakers. Um, I'm gonna actually hand it to Emmy. Thank you. Um, yeah, re reading your notes as well. There's <laughs> a lot uh, that you've discussed here and I'm learning a lot on the way. But moving on, um, we have, uh, uh, Lenny here with us, very happy to have you um, from Particles.io and talking about open particles. Over to you, Lenny. Thank you so much. Um, it's just a pleasure to participate. I'd like to thank you for the invitation. And to me personally, um, it's not just exciting. This feels really special to talk to open science uh, champions and ambassadors uh, because I in 2001, I joined the lab of Michael Eisen, who was the co-founder of Public Library of Science. And one of the reasons um, I wanted to be in that lab was because of his championing of open access. And to see, I know how much more we have to do relative to where we were aiming to be, but also to see where the discussion around open science has gone, that it's not just about open access, but it's about the data sets, right? The code, it's about preprints, it's about democratizing uh, peer review to make sure we're peer reviewing preprints and that we get early career researchers and it's more diverse. It, it really is inspiring to me to be on this call, to hear what's being discussed and to see how far we've come. Um, so with that, I will talk a little bit about sharing methods and it really, uh, is aligned with what you just heard uh, about preprints um, and protocol is kind of like a preprint server for methods specifically and very often if you try to submit a protocol to bio archive um, they will tell you actually that should go to protocols io so i'll tell you a little bit more about what makes protocols io special right and that connects to that idea that you just heard from iracha about 
different servers um, and the different fit for what you're sharing. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, while I do that, I can also say that uh, one of the reasons I co-founded Protocols.io had the idea in 2012 and we launched in 2014 um, is because of my own background. I'm a geneticist, uh, both computational and experimental uh, biology, use genetics. And it was my postdoc experience uh, at MIT where I literally spent a year and a half correcting just one step of the protocol that I was using. So instead of a microliter, it needed five. Uh, it was single cell microscopy instead of 15 minute incubation that needed an hour. And after that year and a half, you realize that's not a new paper. That's not a new technique. It's correction of something previously published. So I don't get any credit for it. And everybody else who is using that method gets completely misleading single cell results or has to spend a year or two rediscovering that little tweak. And so I became obsessed with creating a central place where it's easy to share this knowledge and to keep it up to date. And you heard from Arache about versioning. And I think that's absolutely critical, particularly for methods, because they're living and breathing, right? You always optimize, you always improve them. Um, so to me, that's one of the really important things. Um, can everybody see yeah. my screen? We can only see the side panel of your screen. It's a really funky share. <laughs> Let's see if this helps. <gasps> Oh, that's okay. How, how about if I try it now? One second. How about now? It's thinking, waiting for it to resolve. <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to resolve. <laughs> oh, sorry, it just says you have to be so difficult. Just oh, a it's moment. Doing countdown. <laughs> Uh, Lenny, I can give you access, uh, remote access to my screen. Let me share it. Um, no, no, no. It does seem to be working. I'm not sure why. Let's see. Technical difficulties, how appropriate for sharing a technical platform. Let's see. And how about now? Are you able to see the screen or still not? still seems to be the same thing. Maybe, Moveka, you can share? That is exactly what I would like. Um, so let me try one last time. You have access to my screen now. So if you use your mouse as if it's your own screen, it should work. It's lovely. But I did want to do a live demo of protocol. Okay. So let me try one last time to click share. And if not, then we'll just go with what's on the screen. Um, hold on just a second. And if I say desktop one, is that better? Is it that doing... is better. We can it, see the presentation. Works. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. And sorry about uh the, the hiccup so um i often start with one of my favorite tweets from a postdoc at uh uc riverside who says i'm looking uh, reading a paper looking for a protocol in 1997 paper as described in 96 finds 96 paper as described in 87 finds 87 paper it's paywalled and that's a very common and frustrating experience um, this is from a biologist here's one from a physicist uh, where he says devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described, and the original reference is devices were fabricated with conventional methods, right? So good luck while reading the paper and figuring out exactly what was done um, and how to replicate it and build on it. And this is really the mission of protocols.io is to improve what we publish to make it easier to share our methods long before publishing and preprint or semi privately. And then after you've published it, as I said, with my own personal experience to have a place where we can come back to, to share corrections and optimizations. Um, I've shared the slides, so um, I don't want to do much with the slides. I just want, because this is really quick, um, 
to show a little bit of the platform and what I think makes it unique. So our mission, as I said, is to make this sharing easier and more rigorous. Um, Protocols.io is open access, CC by license um, for everything that's public. If you're sharing, our business model is we charge for keeping things private or private collaborations. If you're in industry and you're never publishing, that's paid. If you're sharing publicly, just as BioArchive, it's free to read, free to share, open access, CC by. And, um, you know, as I said, we started in 2014. We're now at a point where we have over 9,000 public protocols. Um, and here's one of my favorite examples. These are not just PDFs. They're dynamic and interactive. People add videos inside to show you what exactly they mean, grind the tissue. Uh, you can shoot a 10 second video. We have catalogs from reagent vendors so you can detail exactly what you used, what are the materials that are needed, where you've ordered it. Um, and one of my favorite examples is this uh, protocol from a researcher in Australian National University. And if you look at this step in the protocol, it doesn't matter what the details are, but this step, think of it as a recipe for cooking. This step says, do something for two to two minutes, timer in it says seven minutes, and this is confusing. And instead of an email exchange or this being a final paper, um, because protocols are dynamic and interactive, you can mouse over on the step, you can click on it, you can ask a question, and you can see on the right-hand side, one of the researchers reading it said, wait, should it be two to seven minutes? What does that mean? The question goes to the author and everyone who's using the protocol, and you can see the reply right there. So instead of private email conversations and answering a question, the same question 10 times to different people, you sort of have a public FAQ that's being built up. And with a click of a button, you can create a new version. Again, going back to the first talk we heard today, you can create a new version. Um, that conversation is still there, um, but this gets its own DOI. You can cite specific versions. And now you can see it says that step is fixed. That was a typo. The author made version four and it says, whoops, all right, it should be two to three minutes. Timer is not seven anymore. So it's corrected. And if you go next to the title, there is a compare button that allows you to see what is the same what's different between the steps what was modified between the versions right so you have a snapshot and a bird's eye view of what are those differences what are the tweaks and optimizations now obviously i cannot change your protocol i cannot create a new version of it only the author the owner of the protocol can but we do have just as on github we do have copying and forking so I can make a branch of your protocol. You work with grasshoppers, I work with crickets, you're doing this step at room temperature, I do it at 30 degrees. And so I can make a clone of your protocol, it becomes mine, I can edit it as I use it with my equipment, with my strain or species. And then when I'm ready, I can share it and we try to give really clear credit to both the original authors, and to show what's the evolution of the protocol. So you can see on this protocol itself, um, you can see that it is a fork from another protocol and you can look at that history. You can click on the forks tab to see what's the evolution of the versions and forks and the same compare and contrast functionality applies. Um, there are a lot of, it's a, we have a really powerful editor that uh, is kind of like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, concurrent editing, but really meant for methods with the reagents, which, which data set did you use, right? Catalog numbers, videos, um, all of the things that I'm mentioning. So check it out. It doesn't cost anything to create an account, start sharing protocols, as I said, it's free. You can always get in touch, request a one-on-one -on -one demo for more in-depth. I don't have time to talk about everything we've built since 2014. But for open science specifically, I did want to highlight something. So we have communities. It's not just a giant repository. We have 9,000 public protocols at this point. It's growing quickly. But we also let people create communities where you can organize the methods together. Um, so this is, this is a one-year-old, obviously, 
community of people who are working on coronavirus related methods. There's half a thousand researchers in this group, 230 plus protocols for sequencing, testing for um, wastewater monitoring, tracking variants. And because these are communities, when new protocols come in or when updates happen, um, everyone is notified. Everyone knows when there's a new version, new fork, a new protocol added, or when discussions happen that I showed you. So it becomes um, a collaborative method development workspace that's out in the open. You can also have a private side, but I really wanted to focus on the mission and the public side of this. And from these coronavirus protocols, I really want to highlight, because it's just an amazing example, I want to highlight this protocol from, um, it's actually funded by Wellcome Trust, uh, the group that shared it from University of Birmingham. This was the first protocol um, on coronavirus that we got on protocols.io, January 25th of 2020. And what I find amazing about it is that the group that shared it, you can see it's actually a fork from there. This is a sequencing of the coronavirus RNA. Um, this protocol is a fork from what they shared in September of 2019, before we even had coronavirus. It's a fork from their Ebola protocol, right? And they shared it's like 100 plus methods. This is funded by Wellcome Trust and UKRI, their work. They shared this Ebola protocol in September. And as soon as they got the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing going in January, with a click of a button, they made a fork they change those few things. Um, and again, you can do the compare and contrast, and you can see what was in the Ebola protocol and it's tiny things, right? Um, as, as, you, as you can see, when you click compare, the differences are really small. Let me actually go back to the first version. It's easier to demonstrate. So what they shared on January 22nd, I said 25th, it was January 22nd. If you click the compare to check it against the Ebola protocol, the differences are really tiny. Um, they use the same amount of DNTPs, random hexamers, and in you know step two is the same. Step one, instead of 10 microliters of Ebola RNA, you need 11 microliters of SARS-CoV-2, right? It's a small difference, but it's important. And this is really, critical for methods. Um, that microliter can make a big difference for efficiency. It's the same as my story with that one microliter to five microliters uh, making or breaking the protocol. And this is a beautiful example because they were able to share it quickly. They were already on the platform. They had the Ebola protocol up. They shared it rapidly. In a year, um, if you look at this protocol, right? Uh, no, it's not a paper but there are 120,000 views of it. There are 2,000 exports into PDF, printing it out, right? Uh, 57 people made copies of it and modified it as they use it in their research group to get the uh, whole genome sequencing SARS-CoV-2. 160 comments of it. Um, and no, it's not a paper. We're not a journal. It may end up in a paper at some point, um, but this is that rapid sharing, preprint-like sharing that is uh, critical to open science. And before I take questions, um, the last thing that is really special for me in highlighting is when you're not just sharing a supplementary, but you're putting things in the right repository, the same way that we put protein sequences in PDB, and DNA sequences and GenBank, um, when you put things in the right repository, they become discoverable. And uh, I showed the live demo, so I skip, skip those slides. And I love this example where a researcher in Chile is asking, does anybody have a protocol for RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures? A postdoc at UCSF says, there's a couple on protocols.io, but here's the one that I recommend for you. And what is, what, what feels so amazing to me about this example is that when you look at the protocol itself that the uh, postdoc pointed to that should work for this Chilean scientist, the protocol accompanies a paper in the journal Giga Science on parasites of stickleback fish, 
right? So it has nothing to do with cortical neuron cultures. That paper is parasites of stickleback fish, but because they didn't just add a PDF as a supplementary file to their paper and chances that somebody looking for protocol for cortical neuron cultures would be reading this paper are close to zero, but because the authors shared it openly in a repository, not only did they make their paper more rigorous and reproducible and easier for others to repeat, but they're adding to a knowledge base where people can find their protocol, fork it, use it for their technique, use it for their species with their equipment. And so um, I will end there. There are a lot of funders that are now recommending protocols.io. Um, over 500 journals, when you submit a paper, encourage you to put a protocol on protocols.io and link to it. Um, so take a look at the platform and I'll stop there and would be delighted to answer questions. Oi, and the most, I'm rushing so much to make sure that there is time for questions that the most important slide I didn't put up, uh, this is the team. Um, I get the credit for the work I didn't do. I didn't program the apps. I didn't build the platform. That's my, these are my brilliant co-founders, Alexei and Irina from day one of protocols.io. Alexei has been leading the engineering team and we welcome feedback requests, suggestions, um, and we're working daily even though we launched uh, back in 2014, we're working daily on making it better and making it work for uh, researchers like you. Thank you so much, Lenny. Um, loads of comments in the chat as well saying this is really amazing, amazing work. Um, just incredible to see uh, the development um, sort of life of protocols um, extending beyond you know, the, the paper itself. And, really seeing that manifest. Um, questions, we have loads of them. I will read them if I may. Um, so uh, there's a question, can I publish a protocol that I am using, which is just a slight modification of a previous method? Um, this person who asked this question feels kind of bad to publish a protocol that will have their name, but not really theirs. That's a fantastic question. I have actually a whole workshop webinar that I've done not long ago on copyright credit and scooping. And it, one of those, one of the FAQ, one of the things I touch on there is exactly this question. Um, and Protocols IO wasn't built for the one gold method, right? Like this is the Bible. This is what everyone does. It's meant for capturing that universe of tweaks, right? And they can be slight modifications, but literally we're talking in what I just showed the example, right? We're talking about 11 microliters versus 10 of the RNA from Ebola to um, SARS-CoV-2, and that makes a difference. So I hesitate to say what's too minor, right? If this is what you used, if this is what you did, you should share it, you should cite the original. And this is how we all of our sciences build that way, right? We cite previous work. We say we're using an extension of it. Um, but I would argue that you're giving more credit to the other people and you're making science better by sharing those uh, modifications, right? And I, I will never say what is too minor to share, right? Like if it's really just a little comment, put it on the original protocol. But if that protocol is not on protocols.io, you're doing those authors a favor by putting it up, pointing to it, giving them more exposure and making sure that just like a DNA sequence, it's not sitting on a web website or on a hard drive, but is available in a central place where others can get to it. Um, I will, um, I don't want to monopolize. I know there is also the citizen science panel. I will a little bit later today personally go through all of the questions uh, in the Google Doc. I look forward to answering them. Um, I should also say my email is Lenny at protocols.io. You can email me personally. You can uh, book a demo with our head of customer support. So we have a small but wonderful team. We're happy to do more demos to answer questions. And as I said, we really welcome the feedback. But maybe time for one more question. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's let's do one more. And then if, if folks could keep watching the, the Google Doc uh, for Lenny's answers later, that would be great. And thank you so much for doing this. Um, I guess I get to pick. Can I share non-lab methods on protocols.io? 
Uh, we started thinking that this is for wet lab research, but there are a lot of computational methods. There's social sciences. We've expanded a lot, as Arachia would know when she was at PLOS. We expanded when Public Library of Science started really recommending, um, particularly PLOS One um, started recommending that people put protocols in protocols IO. So we've gotten psychology. Uh, we even have some cooking recipes. If you're putting in something that's not related to research, you can make it public. It can be instructions for IKEA furniture, but just say that that's not research, so it doesn't go into the main research uh, repository section. But we welcome all fields and um, instructions. You know, research methods are research methods. It doesn't have to be for field or wet lab work. So we very much welcome it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to answering the questions. And I. Uh, these were two fantastic ones. I'm sure there are many more great ones, but I wanted to end on, you know, when I showed the Ebola versus SARS-CoV-2 and particularly for this um, open life science uh, training that you're going through, it's ambassadors like you that give me hope about the future of science. Um, it's People like Mike Eisen, who are not just thinking about the research, but are thinking about how to make the research enterprise better for everyone and to accelerate science. And particularly during the pandemic time, I want us to think about, you know, how beautiful the examples of rapid sharing during coronavirus among the researchers, how it speeds up science, how we all say we need preprints, but I want us to keep in mind you know, what happens after the pandemic? Um, why is it only for Zika, Ebola, and coronavirus that we feel the urgency to make the science go as fast as it can, but then somehow pediatric cancer patients or malaria patients have the luxury of time? Like, why doesn't this apply to all of science, all of research, whether pandemic related or not, right? It doesn't have to be a crisis. You know, is climate change somehow something that we don't need to be working on as rapidly? And so it really is people like you that push us towards that more rapid, more perfect science sharing and accelerating research. And um, you people inspire me. So thank you for letting me join. And I look forward to answering more questions. And thank you for being champions of open science and to the organizers of this whole uh, multi-week training. Um, I absolutely love what you're doing. And I'll shut up there. Thank you so much. I those I feel like those are words for us to all remember. Um, but for now, thank you. Uh, let's let's uh, have, um, very happy also to have Georgia with us today. Um, so I'll give her the space um, and time to talk about her projects in citizen science. Thank you so much. And thank you, Aretha and Lenny. Uh, really inspiring, um, interesting talks. Um, I'm aware I don't have like a, a huge amount of time and um, we only just kept the time before. So I'm sorry if this is like, if I go at quite a speed through this, um, but I'm here to talk about participatory and citizen science, which are two very closely related scientific methods that um, are very value aligned. And I think also, um, quite productive towards open research and open science. And I'm here with um, some citizen scientists who are working with me on the project, um, Suzanne Iwai, Otis Smith and Sarah Markham. They're all fantastic contributors, they're all autistic and they're gonna talk to you in more detail about their experiences and areas of expertise. So just to go through some very um, brief explanations, citizen science basically involves any science in which um, people who are non-professional scientists take part. Many of you may be familiar with Zooniverse or open source funding. These are ones that target very particular parts of the research cycle. Um, participatory science is in many respects a more stringent requirement. It means that the people for whom there is most at stake in the research um, are involved in empowered positions and direct direction setting positions. So not just consulted and not just doing some part of the process without knowing why they have to be informed and they have to be able to direct it. Um, I think this is really important for breaking down the boundary between the knower and the known. 
Um, and as Sarah will talk about later, there are some really good reasons why we need to be very careful as researchers and scientists about um, thinking we know more than we do and not listening to the subjects of our research. Um, as I said before, all of these methods go together. So I'm working on building a citizen science project currently, which has been co-created with members of the autistic community to investigate sensory processing and autism. The participatory research aspect brings autistic people in at every stage of the research process from, um, so it started with a Jane Glynd Alliance setting, a priority setting exercise, which consulted more than a thousand autistic people about what questions um, needed to be answered by autism research. Citizen science allows it to be scaled um, and reach more people. So a citizen science platform means that it's not as intensive in terms of one-to-one -one research or time. And open source development is a wonderful way of um, creating the transparency that you need for participatory science to be meaningful, as well as, um, as we've been discussing before um, in this session, um, it allows you to collaborate with all of these incredible experts around the world who can give you their experience too. Um, so now, uh, Dr. Sarah Markham, who is a researcher herself, as well as um, having lived experience with autism, is going to talk about why participatory science um, is important in relation to heuristics in autism research. So over to you, Sarah. Do we have Sarah here? Sarah Markham. You do now. I was mute. I was muted. Ah, okay, that solves the mystery. All right. Yes. Well, it's it's quite ironic that the word heuristic is in the title when research has shown that autistic people themselves are less susceptible to many of the biases that um, more neurotypical people uh, are culpable of. But, but back to the presentation in hand, um, yes, changing approaches to autism research. It's gone from, you know, viewing, you know, the, the, uh, the autistic person uh, by the little professor model of Hans Asperger, We've progressed onto the autistic spectrum, looking at a multi-dimensional approach to autism. And then well, now we have the autism constellation model, which kind of looks like a, a crossover between a woodwork project and string theory, where you can look at those dimensions being curled up and perhaps sometimes unfurling and, um, and then curling up again. But the exciting thing about participatory science is that it's a form of action research where the people, the subjects themselves are in a way actually doing the science and setting the protocols and changing the protocols. They're doing the versioning themselves um, as they progress through the scientific journey. So we're kind of experiencing a paradigm shift um, by this participatory science approach. It's a way of challenging conventional static means of conducting science. It's making it a more agile, adaptive, um, evolutionary approach. Um, and it kind of will hopefully help in that sense, disperse some of the rigid stereotypes around autistic people, that's me. Fabulous, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about the specific program that myself, Sue, Sarah and Otis have all been working on with a number of other people. So this is Art Spaces. Um, it's currently being prototyped. Um, basically, it's a website where autistic people can share experiences of their daily lives. And those experiences will then be used to understand more about sensory processing differences. So around 90%, depending on the study of autistic people have sensory processing differences. And it's sometimes been used as a criteria of diagnosing autism, although that fluctuates. Um, there's lots of lab-based studies into this, but there's very little around how this actually affects autistic people and impacts on their lives. 
Um, so the idea is to use this data set to pull out some common themes, but also get a sense of the diversity and the individual, like the granularity of those range of experiences and use those to make environments more accessible to autistic people. Um, for example, by changing public policy, modifying environments. Um, one thing I did want to call your attention to in particular about this platform is that it uses a fine grained consent model. So um, every single user can choose who they share their experience with and for what purpose, whether it's for research or published on the platform or both. And it's a dynamic consent model as well. Um, so they will be able to withdraw their data when, whenever they want, um, put it back as many times as they like. And also there's a moderation process that is being developed along with this platform with autistic citizen science scientists. So instead of these things being imposed on autistic people by researchers, this is really coming from the autistic population because they know the most about their own experiences. Um, this looks a very busy slide, but it's, I think, um, for me, this is a lot of the, the whole range of possibilities that participatory citizen science can offer. Um, so one of the things that I did in the last OLS cohort, because I did cohort two, and I can see Katharina is here actually as well, who's also been working with me on the project. So I um, hope you're enjoying OLS. I learned loads from it. Um, this is the kind of mapping exercise that I did. and trying to work out what all of the skills and resources that were needed for the platform were. And it was important that autistic people were involved in every single aspect, as well as every part of the research stage. So you can see that this kind of circle here, um, with the yellow, it's autistic people have been involved in literally every part of this, from hypothesizing, designing the experiment, processing data, drawing conclusions, and so on. Um, also, as well as lived experience, of course, autistic people are people, they're individuals with their own unique skill sets. So a huge amount of how the project is being designed um, is around those unique skill sets. You can see here, um, there is a whole range of people being matched to skills, including platform development. Um, we're entirely open source. Uh, the protocols actually are all published in our repository um, and is available for reuse. Um, were linked into the Turing Way and amongst other things. Um, so you're welcome to join if you're interested, anyone can come along. Um, you can see here that actually open source and open research can work with people who are not as familiar with GitHub but are interested in the project. So these are two examples of working with community members who are citizen scientists to design aspects of the project. The first one is guidance on looking through data and understanding what you might want to remove or what you might think about when you're deciding whether you want something to be published or not. When I wrote it, it was these really academic jargony paragraphs. And this is um, a collaborator called James Scott who just broke it down into these really beautiful, extremely simple point by point steps. And on the other side, you see something that I was working on with Sue, who I'm gonna pass over to in a moment. Um, this is a color coded version of tasks that people can do on GitHub from easy to difficult. So the green is you may not have that much experience, the red is you have to be pretty advanced. And those are now the labeling system for all of the issues on GitHub are now based on Sue's design um, to make it more accessible for autistic people. Um, so now I'm gonna pass over to Sue and she will talk about her experience for a little bit. And then after that, I will pass over to Otis. So over to you, Sue. Hi, I'm um, Sue EY. And uh, I turned 67 on Monday, and I'm of an age where I remember non-digital engagement of any kind, and scientists were scientists and people were people, and never the twain should meet. So I, I, being involved in the focus groups and stuff, I can actually totally relate to what Sarah was talking about, the constellations, because my birth chart comes across as a splash chart. So I have a smattering of all sorts of different things, including um, creativity as a poet, a wordsmith, um, I'm great at community engagement, proofreading, newsletters, that sort of stuff. So I was involved with the focus groups and I moved on to the point where we were developing the digital platform with alt spaces and found myself learning this different language and possibly Georgia and everyone learning about my accessibility language where I'm reiterating things from my both my autistic community and my work with my local borough council, London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. So, you know, doing this stuff, the labels was, was great, but 
also having the meetups every fortnight where we invite anyone who's worked on it with us so far and then new people to collaborate with us. We purposize it once a fortnight. So I um, expanded my Twitter account exponentially. Um, I'm using my poetry and everything to try and hook people in. So some of the people I'm working with in the alt space meetups are, are other scientists working both um, at university level and um, new people. So we we supportive of everybody's ability to be inclusive and accessibility is really important because if we don't make it accessible for the data input, then we've nothing to extract. And I'm actually in a new unique position. I'm working in the end game with my borough doing a new civic campus and public realm. So I'm putting into practice my influence on ambient environment. And when those buildings and public realm are up, I'll be able to feed in data from my experience navigating these environments to add to the platform. And it's that reiterative kind of approach of adding and building layers that will make our stuff, I think, profoundly um, groundbreaking. And I'm really grateful to be a part of it. And today, I actually, in a different event, I take part in a human library, which I can send a resource to someone. Uh, I was being read as, a, as an autistic book by someone from Publicis in their PR wing in Langland, and they do a lot of clinical trials with autism. So when I mentioned our work on art spaces, all the pens came out, everyone started writing stuff down. So I'm looking forward to maybe seeing some of, of, of Publicis and Langland perhaps joining in in the future. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sue. Sue has been absolutely amazing. Um, and so has Otis, who has been part of the project from the very start. So I'm gonna hand over to him now. Um, and just to let you all know, everybody is welcome to join the meetup sessions that Sue was talking about to find out for Thursday um, of every month from 12.30 to 2.30 um, GMT. So uh, yeah, it's an open invite. Over to you, Otis. Hello, good evening to all of you. Hello, my name is Otis Smith. I'm part of the Citizen Science Project. I'm one of the many contributors a part of this project. I myself have been autistic since the age of 15. What led me to be part of the project was the opportunity and potential to try and create a space for autistic people that works, appeals and benefits to all, as well as broadening, expanding the project further and planting new skills, tools and resources, thinking of different ways and strategies to make the platform authentic, accessible, engaging and interactive as possible. Being a part of the Citizen Science Project has given me a complete whole new meaning, outlook and purpose to improve and be better. What I enjoy about being included in the Citizen Science Project is that everyone has their own take and contribution, no matter how big or small. Each day comes with its own challenges, as well as discoveries that will implement and utilize to our core strengths and values whilst using several but effective techniques and expertise. I'm having the opportunity to meet and work alongside others, to discuss the agendas, to sharing new and effective ideas. It's been such a privilege to be part of this project. It's changed at times, challenged my thoughts and own perceptions, reassessing and re-evaluating different topics and strategies. It's been eye-opening and fulfilling at the same time. The Citizen Science Project displays such depth and true character and representation of the aims and does not look at things in an unrealistic approach. The group goes far and beyond to ensure that the work we put in can have such a positive impact and make a difference. The reward for me is knowing that the work we have contributed can hopefully expand and help towards not just a few, but the many. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Otis. Um, thank you also to all of these wonderful people, especially Kirsty Whitaker, who is the PI of the project, and it's basically her vision, and Nelda, who was my mentor on the last OLS. Um, all of the autistic community collaborators and open source contributors and lots of people here as well have actually helped. So Katharina, Malvika, Yo has helped. So basically, thank you, everyone. And here are some different ways of joining in the project if you're curious. Uh, so that's all from me. Happy to answer any questions, although I appreciate we've run over. Thank you so much, Georgia and uh, Otis and Sarah and Sue. Um, 
really, really lovely to hear um, all of your perspectives and what you've gained and just, just yeah, really, really <laughs> inspired and, and impressed and, and just amazing to hear. Um, I, yeah, um, I'm sorry that we're, we're overrunning folks, um, but um, I, I guess if you have any questions at this point, please do um, put them on Slack. Um, maybe Georgia, you could you could see uh, keep an eye on that, and we'll ping you as well if anything comes through. And of course, in the Google Doc as well. Um, I think should I do the close? <laughs> could I just okay. make one comment? Yes, definitely. I think that we're all bright sparks in open science because the intention is to share and make a difference using the skill sets we've got and the skill sets we're acquiring through collaboration. So I commend everybody. Thank you so much, Ned. Love, love, love you, what you said about us all being um, by sparks in open science. Um, everyone has a chance to be that as well. Um, yeah, so, so folks, uh, thank you for joining us this week. Um, if that you have any remaining assignments from the last weeks, this is a great time to catch up. Um, if you are a bit lost, please don't worry. Um, I definitely, for like, <laughs> there are many things going on in our lives at the moment. So um, if you need help, please do reach out to each other, to your mentors, to your experts, um, invite them into your, uh, your calls and conversations if you need to. Um, there is a midterm survey that we have because we're halfway through. So uh, please do complete it to help us um, and help yourself understand you know, what you've learned so far. Um, and next week, I believe we have a call on Wednesday um, on self-care and ally skills. So um, for uh, the latest information on when that will take place, where the notes are, the Zoom, the Zoom link, which is in the notes, um, the calendar is the best place to go to for that. I hope I've covered everything and thank you so much for staying with us all the way to the end. Um, thank you so much again for to all of our speakers today. It's been wonderful to have you with us. Uh, with that, we stop the recording and have a nice week. You too. <laughs>